So this morning we're continuing our series called uh, Thinking Christian, and, and the, the title of this series has two kind of meanings to it. One is that I think Christians should be known as people who think. I think, I believe, that Christians are individuals who should kind of explore and wrestle and kind of dig into stuff and not just go, oh, that's got to be true because the pastor said it or I saw it on Sunday or something like that. That's one side of it. The other side of it is I do believe that there is a way for us to process our thoughts that needs to be lined up with the historical faith of Christianity, but specifically Scripture. So there's a certain way to think about stuff that historically, like through the life of the 2,000 years of the church, has been like, this is how we process this. This is how we understand our world and everything that we, goes on around us. And so there's the two sides of it that I want us to be kind of diving into as a community, as people who explore this. And so for some of you, you will be in small groups, and you can go in the week and kind of dive deeper into those questions. For some of us who aren't in small groups, we do have some questions. If you want to personally explore, you're always welcome to do that as well. Or you could always join a small group. But as we're in this series, we're in a second week now, and the first week we explored how our thoughts, what we think, develops into a belief. So how we think and what we think about will start to shape what we believe, whether it's about ourselves or the world around us. And from those beliefs come actions. It's how we live our life. So if I think that I am a person who is of value, who is of worth, who is, as Paul tells us, God's masterpiece created for good works by Christ Jesus and for Christ Jesus, if I believe that, if I think that and I believe that, I will live a life that reflects it. But if I think that I am worthless, that I'm unlovable, that I've done nothing good ever, that permeates into my belief of self and self-worth, and I will live a life that is miserable. I will not see any good in myself, and I won't see good that people are trying to share with me. What we think shapes how we live. This is why this is important, because we all, right now, are living, and at least for a while, and we got to figure out how do we live in the most faithful way to Jesus. And so this morning, we're going to be exploring some more on that, our thoughts, and specifically something that might be challenging for some of us. It might be something that as we think, as we process through this, we might have some objections to it. And that's okay. It is okay to disagree with me. But don't just disagree and walk away. Disagree and dive deeper. Figure out why you disagree. And so as we explore this this morning, my hope and my prayer is that you don't walk away from the online service, uh, whether you're watching it live or later on, or from the service this morning and go to your Thanksgiving afternoons and go, wow, that was the worst service ever. I mean, like, it could be. That's fine. But if it's just because you disagree, figure out why you disagree, and if it is the right thing to be disagreeing with. Because a lot of it has to do with who we are and our experience. Some of you may have seen this image, it was really popular a little while ago on the internet, and I used to see it all the time, where there's two people looking at a number that is printed onto the ground. Right? And so one is saying, from my perspective, it's number six, another is saying, from my perspective, it's number nine. And typically, when you see this posted, whether it's on Facebook or Instagram or Twitter or somewhere, uh, the purpose of it is to say, well, your experience dictates your truth. So that if you believe it says six, you're not wrong, and neither is the other person on the other side. Because where your vantage point is, that's how you are perceiving the reality of it. And because you're perceiving the reality of it like this, that is true to you. And I'm not going to disagree with that. Your experience shapes who you are. Your experience shapes how you see the world. From how you grew up when you were a kid, to your experience as a teenager in high school and what teachers said to you, to, to you know, your own adult life, to your senior life, to being whatever, your job, all those experiences, the things that have happened to you and the things that happen around you, shape you and how you see the world. There's no denying that. From where you grew up, your country of origin, and the culture that 
resides there because every culture has differences, to your age, to all kinds of factors, change how you perceive the world around you. The challenge with that is sometimes maybe we're not seeing things clearly and what we think is true really isn't the truth. And that's what I want to explore this morning. It might be hard for us to explore that because we do live in a culture where there's two ideas about truth. One is that truth is relative. Like I said, based on your experience, what have you gone through, what have you lived through, your education, all those things, you perceive truth, the truth, who you are, the world around you, in a certain way. And the way you perceive it is up to you, and no one can say you're wrong. It's a relative view. It means there's no absolute truth to hold to. And the other one is absolute truth. To say there is a way in which we see the world that is unchangeable. There is a way for us to understand things, even though our experience is made different, but to understand it through a lens of understanding that clarifies how we think about this experience. For those who are on the relative side, they would say, well, there's absolutely no absolute truth, which you should think about that statement. For those who are on the absolute side, they would say, yes, there is. And so how do we wrestle with that? We all have different experiences, different understandings of it, and so how do we make sense of it for ourselves, but also be rooted somewhere that it's not just about my feelings or experiences? This isn't a new struggle. In fact, this is a struggle that people have gone through throughout history. If you read through some ancient Greek philosophers where we get a lot of our thinking from, where we realize it or not, this wasn't an uncommon thought about how we perceive reality how we perceive what is really real and what is not really real. In fact, it's it's an issue that Jesus encountered in the most vulnerable moments of his life. In John's gospel near the end, where Jesus is approaching his death, he is taken to Pilate. And as he's taken to Pilate, he is being interviewed or or challenged by him, And it says this in John chapter 18, starting at verse 28. It says, Then the Jewish leaders took Jesus from Caiaphas to the palace of the Roman governor. By now it was early morning, and to avoid ceremonial uncleanness, they did not enter the palace because they wanted to be able to eat the Passover. So Pilate came out to them and asked, What charges are you bringing against this man? If he were not a criminal, they replied, we would not have handed him over to you. Pilate said, take him yourself and judge him by your own law. But we have no right to execute anyone, they objected. So they knew what they wanted to happen here. They brought Jesus to Pilate, the Roman governor, with the intent of having him die. Very specific. This took place to fulfill what Jesus had said about the kind of death he was going to die. Pilate then went back inside the palace, summoned Jesus, and asked him, Are you the king of the Jews? Is that your own idea, Jesus asked? Or did others talk to you about me? Am I a Jew, Pilate replied? Your own people and chief priests handed you over to me. What is it that you have done? In verse 36, he says, My kingdom is not of this world. If it were, my servants would fight to prevent my arrest by the Jewish leaders. But now my kingdom is from another place. You are a king then, Pilate said. Jesus answered, you say that I am a king. In fact, and this is really important, Jesus explicitly says why he's here. In fact, the reason I was born and came into this world is to testify to the truth. Everyone on the side of truth listens to me. What is truth? retorted Pilate. And we'll stop there. Jesus expressly says what he came for, to testify to the truth. And Pilate responds with a very common to what we would probably experience in our own lives question, well, what is that truth? What could it be? 
Is it different based on my experience? Is it different based on my time in life? What is, it, what is truth? First, Jesus is making a very serious implication that there is a truth. And that word truth comes from a Greek word, aletheia, which is kind of like Alicia, if you have it as a girl's name. But aletheia means reality. He came to show reality, truth. And Pilate says, well, what is reality anyway? Based on his own experiences, his reality would be very different. Pilate was, was a ruler. He was wealthy. He didn't have to worry about where his meals would come from. He wouldn't have to worry about anything except for maybe war. Whereas someone like Jesus, his reality was one of poverty, one of struggle, and at this point, imprisonment. Is there a final truth in it, a absolute truth beyond their experience? That's the question. What is reality? Is it just based on how I've experienced life and I can define reality as, though well, this is whatever I want it to be? Or is there some greater standard that defines it? When we think about it, many of us will say, well, you know, your experience makes you you, and so we respect and tolerate people that have different views. That's a good thing. I'm not going to stand up here and say, don't express tolerance or love to people who are different than you. But don't pretend that there isn't a greater calling on your life either, and one that lines up with the one who testifies about the truth, and in fact, says he is the way, the truth, and the life. When we think about truth or perspective, let's try and take an example. Most of us, I won't say all of us, but most of us would say something like, murder is bad, right? And we would agree to that. Murder is wrong. We might qualify it. We might say, well, maybe there's just war, so maybe there's some expression of war and that's okay. Maybe there's capital punishment. Some of us have that view. Most of us would say murder is wrong, though, just expressly. But what do you do when your view encounters someone who's different, would you say that murder is wrong absolutely, or would you say it's selectively wrong? Like, what would you do if you encountered a tribe in Papua New Guinea that practices cannibalism still today, or at least 10 years ago they did? Would you say, well, they're wrong, or would you say, well, for them, it's true and okay to kill and eat people? Is there an absolute we can get to? Is there a moral morality or moral code that we would say, this should be universal? I know that's an extreme example, and most of us will never encounter people who are cannibals, and hopefully never, uh, or have that desire ourselves. But when we are looking at the reality of our difference of perspective, how do we know what we should be believing? How should we be thinking? If Jesus says, he is the way, the truth, and the life, and no one comes to the Father except through him, what do we do with a statement like that that is an absolute statement? No one is pretty strong. These aren't easy things to wrestle with. Here's the thing about truth. Truth is incredibly narrow. It's not wide. Truth, by definition, by its very character, is a narrow thing. Two plus two is four. That's truth. You might try to justify it, say, well, if there's a negative sign, but that's not the equation. It's two plus two is four. It's never five. Truth is narrow. And Jesus expressed this in Matthew's gospel as well. In a section that we looked at a bit last week, and maybe some of you were reading in called the Sermon on the Mount, an expression where Jesus is, is compiled his teachings, and he's expressing them to his people to say, this is what we believe as followers of me. He says this in chapter 7, verse 13. He says, Enter through the narrow gate, for wide is the gate and broad is the road that leads to destruction. And many enter through it. But small is the gate and narrow is the road that leads to life. And only a few find it. Jesus' expression is that there is a way, and that way is actually him. As he says, he is the way, the truth, and the life. He is the truth. He is the way. And it's narrow. It's focused. It's not everywhere. We can learn and express and with humility listen to others and learn from them. 
But there is a way of Jesus, and that is narrow. And sometimes it sounds offensive, which is very difficult for us to embrace. One of the things when I came here as pastor, one of the things I shared with our leaders and we've kind of adopted is we don't want to make it difficult for anyone to follow Jesus because it's difficult enough the, what, the standard that he has for us. This is the difficulty of following Jesus. There is a way that appears right to us but leads to destruction. And narrow is the gate that he's prepared for us, the way, the truth, and the life. It is the lens in which we see reality, in which we think through, we filter our thoughts through, that will shape who we are, what we believe, and how we follow Jesus. And that lens should be Jesus himself, rooted in Scripture. So it's not an excuse to say, I'm right, you're wrong. If anything, it's a reason to say, I am sifting everything through this understanding of who Jesus is, and I am incredibly humble because of it. Not accusing or mean or cruel, but loving and gracious and working to share and listen and understand. The way of Jesus is narrow. It's not easy. It is a way of truth, of an absolute. Again, not easy. In Jeremiah, um, the prophet is speaking for God and he's speaking to the people of God. And the people of God have gone astray, the, the Judah, the people of God. They've started to worship idols. They've started to do all kinds of things they were not supposed to be doing. There was a narrow way and they decided to go the wide way. And in Jeremiah 17, chapter 9, uh, verse 9, uh, as God is speaking through this prophet, he says that the heart, the heart, our heart is deceitful. And in some translations would say, is desperately wicked, and no one can know it. The author of Proverbs would say, there's a way of our heart, there's a way of us that seems right, but actually leads to destruction. Jesus says, wide is the path that leads to destruction, but narrow is the one for life. Sometimes because of our experiences, because of what we feel, because of who we encounter, we want to show compassion and love for ourselves and for others, which is a good thing, but we embrace more and call it true, and it's actually not. Sometimes we have to wrestle and figure out what is the narrow way. We live in a world that embraces everything. Is that the way of Jesus? No, it's not. Usually I just leave that as an open question, but I'm going to tell you, it's not. There is a way and it is narrow, and he is that way. So what do you do? What do you do when you encounter yourself? Maybe you've embraced an idea of absolute truth. Maybe you haven't. What do you do with that? Well, I'm going to give you four things to think about. The first thing is this, is you need to decide what is your lens for reality. For you, it might be, though, my, my experience. That is my understanding of reality. That is what I will view everything on. If that is so, you can ignore the next three steps. If you're saying, no, I want Jesus to be my lens, then pay attention. Because there's a way to do that and practice that in your life. The second thing to do is to read the Bible. And it sounds so simple, but there's, there's a caveat to this. Know how to read the Bible. Know how to understand it. This takes work. It's, you know, there are words on paper, and sometimes it's plain and obvious, but sometimes it's not. Learn the difference between what is descriptive, meaning it's explaining this is what happened, and what is prescriptive, saying this is telling you what you should be doing, because they're not the same. There's a lot of description that's not prescription. Learn that it's not written to you, but it's for your use, and you are to grow in your faith through it. Learn to pray and ask the Holy Spirit to guide you as you read it so that you can understand it and apply it. And as I mentioned last week, read the words, hear the words, and just don't walk away from it, but put them into practice. Know what to do when you encounter the Bible. Third thing is to evaluate 
your experience, which is very real and true to you, by God's intention. That image I showed earlier of the two people looking at the number that's missing something. Yes, from their experience, one sees a six, one sees a nine. What they're missing is the creator's intent in putting that on the ground. They were putting a number specific down. What is the creator's intent in your life, in your world? Evaluate your experience based on that. If your experience tells you that you've had horrible upbringing, that your parents were mean, and you think you are worthless, is that the creator's intent? The one who said you are God's masterpiece, his work of art? No. If you just rely on experience, you are going a wide path that leads to destruction. Evaluate your experience through the lens of Jesus that is true. And the fourth thing for those of us who maybe want to follow this is speak the truth in love. Ephesians 4.15 tells us that as we are maturing, we should be speaking the truth in love. Meaning that if you embrace this absolute truth of who Jesus says he is, embrace that and apply that to your life, you are going to encounter people who do not believe it. In fact, I'm sure there are some of us in this room who do not believe it. And as you don't, as you don't believe it or as people who you encounter don't believe it, you don't just say, oh, you're wrong, I'm right. You don't come with arrogance. You speak the truth in love, which means being humble, having humility, listening to people's experience so you try to understand them, but not denying the truth of what Jesus said, not widening that road that leads, ends up leading to destruction, but being faithful to the truth, but speaking it in love. You wonder what love is? Paul expresses in 1 Corinthians 13, as patient, as kind, you can read it yourself. If you want to think Christian, if you want to apply this to your life, you need to decide how you view reality. Is it through the creator's intent for you, or is it through your experience? If it's your experience, I warn you, it doesn't lead to life. Evaluate your experience through the creator's intent, because you are worth so much, and so is every other person. We can't deny it. Some of you are in a, a Bible reading group that we have uh, through a Bible app. This week, we're actually started today in Colossians. If you're wondering, like, how do I jump into reading the Bible? Colossians is a great place to jump in. So if you're in that group, it's a great place. Read a chapter every day. If you're not, just jump in, read Colossians. Because that is this question of what is reality and how do we view it is exactly what that early church was wrestling with. They had a world around them that believed something very different, and they had to figure out, how do we do this? Narrow is the way of Jesus, but it leads to life. Let's remember that, and let's express that life in love to the world around us. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, I thank you uh, for who you are, because who you are helps me to understand who I am and the world around me. And I pray that for all of us, that we learn to evaluate our experience, our life, through your intent for us, for your intent for the goodness of this world, that we can be people who express hope and love and gratitude and not arrogance and disdain or judgmentalism to people we disagree with, to experiences we don't have ourselves. Help us to be open to hear and listen to each other and to listen to our own experience, but not just accept it as is, but see it through how you inform us of who we are in the world around us. I pray that as we take our steps, whether it is to leave here and to go home or whether we're going to spend some time together, that we, we think through what it means to think Christian. We ponder and we wrestle and we dig into, well, what do we believe about truth? How do we see the world? Whether we are unsure or frustrated or even angry, help us to not just give in to that emotion or experience, but to embrace the opportunity to go deeper and mature and learn. Holy Spirit, reveal to us what we need today. 
And I pray all this in Jesus' name.